you could turn those lights on. Okay, so I'll begin with salutation to the Buddha. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo Today we will be doing the Chula Gosinga Sutta. Was that was <laughs> announced by the by Bhavad in the email. It was the Chula Gosinga Sutta. Yeah. Sutta 31 and 32. Excuse me? 31 and 32. Right, okay. Because I realized I had Sutta number 30 originally on the list. But then I think I took that off last week, so that we could catch up. Okay, so this is a sutta which doesn't have a very deep philosophical content, but rather it's important because it shows the kind of harmony that should exist, firstly within the Sangha as the monastic order, but also it serves as a kind of what I would call a model for harmony in human affairs in general. So it's very seldom that one finds such a high degree of, of harmony, even when you have a small group of monastics together, <laughs> it's almost bound to be some reason for quarrels and disputes to break up. Is that so? <laughs> okay, the, so the sutta begins when the Buddha was living in a place called Natika, in the dwelling called the Brick House. And on that occasion, there were three monks. The most prominent of them is named Venerable Anuruddha, and his two companions are Venerable Nandiya and Venerable Kindiya. Kindiya. Okay, so they were all living together in a place called the forest or woods of the Gosinga sal trees. The sal tree, it's a very beautiful tree that grows in northern India, it has a very sweet scent, very beautiful flower. And so when all, of the, all the trees are blossoming, then the forest becomes pervaded by this almost divine scent. Now these three monks, the only one who appears elsewhere in the Nikayas with a prominent role is Venerable Anuruddha. Venerable Anuruddha was a cousin of the Buddha. He was a member of the Sakyan clan. And like other Sakyans, he grew up in a great deal of luxury. And after the Buddha had left the home life and then become enlightened. And when he came back to visit his <coughs> relatives in the city of Kapalavattu, his birthplace, the place where he grew up, um, a great number of the Sakyans went forth and became monks under the Buddha because the Buddha had become a very prestigious spiritual teacher. And so all of the families thought that it was almost obligatory for one of their sons to go forth and become a monk. Then Anuruddha had 
an older brother whose name was Mahanama. And so the two of them discussed together which one should become a monk. And Anuruddha was originally hesitant to become a monk. So he said to Mahanama, why don't you become a monk and I'll stay and live the home life, live the household life. So Mahanama said, well, okay, if that's what you want, we'll do it that way. But let me explain to you a little bit about your responsibilities if you remain in the household life. You'll, you know, our family owns a great number of fields. So when the spring comes, you have to see that the fields are all plowed and you have to do, every day you have to check the fields, make sure that they're plowed properly. Then as the crops are growing, you have to make sure that they're watered every day. You have to make sure that every day that they get sufficient fertilizer. Then when the crops start to grow, when they're full grown, then you have to supervise the harvesting of the crops. You have to make sure that they're all collected, bundled, brought into the storeroom. Then you have to oversee the threshing of the crops. You have to see, oversee the discarding of the waste. Then you have to see that the crops, some are sold on the market, others are distributed to the families. Then by that time, it's almost time for the next plowing season. <laughs> so you have to start to see that, again, that the fields are properly plowed, that the seed is sown, that the crops grow properly, etc., etc., etc. Then Anuruddha asks, somewhat in a mood of exasperation, doesn't this ever come to an end? <laughs> then Mahanama said, no, it doesn't come to an end. It goes on this way year after year after year. Then Anuruddha said, okay, you stay and look after the crops. I'll become a monk. <laughs> okay, so then Anuruddha went forth and became a monk under the Buddha. And he had a special skill which he developed very early. And that is that he immediately was able to enter into deep states of meditation. And after attaining these states of deep meditation, the jhanas, then he was able to open up what is called the deep chakku, the divine eye. And so with the divine eye, he was able to see other world systems, other realms of existence. He was able to see distant galaxies. Do you know the Hubble telescope? What would it be like to have, you don't really have to rely on a telescope, but you just go into kind of deep meditation, and then you just open up a t Hubble telescope within your own inner vision, and then you can see distant galaxies, and you move your vision out to those distant galaxies, then you see beyond them other galaxies, and you move further out to those galaxies, then you see what looks like stars in the distance, and you move further out to those stars, but they turn out to be galaxies in turn. So this was the kind of vision that Anuruddha had. But even though he had this divine vision, he had to struggle very hard to achieve arhatship. There's a sutta which is, it comes in the Anguttara Nikaya, the Book of Threes, where Anuruddha com <laughs> complains to Venmal Sariputta. He says that, I have this divine eye by which I can see thousands of world systems, and yet I'm not able to reach the extinction of the defilements. Oh, he says, yeah, I have this divine eye by which I can see distant world systems. I'm very energetic, very mindful, and yet I'm unable to reach the extinction of defilements. Then Sariputta tells him that you have this attachment to the divine eye. That is a hindrance to you. 
because you're so skilled in meditation. What's making that sound? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because you're so skilled in meditation, that's bringing a subtle mana, a subtle conceit in you, and the fact that you haven't reached the extinction of the defilements, that's, that's causing a subtle excitement or a subtle worrying in you, a restlessness. So you should get rid of your attachment to the divine eye, you should get rid of your pride because of your skill in meditation, and you should stop worrying that you haven't reached the extinction of defilements, but just continue to practice in a very straight way. And so Anuruddha then followed the advice of Sariputta, and then before long he was able to reach the extinction of the defilements. But even during that period when he was practicing, several times he had to be helped by the Buddha. We have in the Majjhima there is a sutta that comes towards the end, I think it's 127, 128. Yeah, it's 120. It's 128. Where the Buddha goes to visit Anuruddha and his friends when they're meditating in solitude, and then they report to the Buddha that they're having certain exceptional experiences in meditation, but they don't know how to overcome them and to develop wisdom or insight. Then the Buddha gives them advice. And then there's another sutta that comes in the Anguttara Nikaya, in the Book of Eights, where Anuruddha, again, he was meditating in solitude, and then seven thoughts occurred to him, which are called thoughts of a great man, a great person. That this Dharma is for one with few wishes, not for one with many desires. This Dharma is for one who is content, not for one who is discontent. The Dharma is for one who is energetic, not for one who lacks energy. Uh, the, the Dharma is for one who is fond of solitude, not for one who is fond of company. The Dharma is for one who is energetic, not for one who lacks energy. The Dharma is for one who is mindful, not for one who lacks mindfulness. For one who has samadhi, concentration, not for one who lacks concentration. And for one who has wisdom, not for one who lacks wisdom. So those were seven thoughts of a great person that Anuruddha had. Then the Buddha came to Anuruddha, I think by supernormal power, and told him that he should remember the eighth thought of a great person. And that is that this Dhamma is for one who does not, who delights in the absence of mental proliferation conceptual, the absence of conceptual fabrication, not for one who delights in conceptual proliferation or conceptual constructions. And so these then became the eight thoughts of the great person. Okay, so this sutta that we're going to read today takes place when Anuruddha and his two friends had already achieved our hardship. But as we'll see as we go along, none of them has reported to the other about their attainment of our hardship. Okay, so now the sutta tells us that one day in the evening, the Buddha rose from his meditation. He was living in the monastery together with, or in this dwelling place together with a large number of monks. And the commentary says that the Buddha simply got up very early, put away all of his belongings, took his extra robe, his extra robe and his arms bowl, and left the dwelling place without reporting to anybody. He didn't tell Sariputta, didn't tell Ananda, 
but he just took off by himself. Why does the Buddha do this? Because sometimes he just likes to wander alone and to go anonymously, not surrounded by a crowd. You know, being a Buddha, it's really like a terrible burden. <laughs> you know, everybody thinks, I want to be a Buddha. I want to be a Buddha so I could be like the... <laughs> like every American kid wants to be president when he grows up. Thinks, I want to be president, I want to be president. And so that's the glory, like every mother tells the kid, you're in America, in America, anybody can be president. So we have a talented young kid who um, does very, he's very successful in school, goes on to college, the best college, goes on to Harvard Law School, gets his law degree, um, starts working his way up through the political ladder, thinking, I've got to be president, I've got to be president. He's popular. He wins the affection of many people, so when the convention comes, they nominate him for the candidate. He runs for the, the well, first in the primary, he wins, he gets the primary selection, and he goes into the election, the presidential election, thinking, I've got to run, I've got to run. You know, during the campaign, you have to work like about 20, 21 hours a day maybe three or four hours of sleep per night, very restless sleep also, thinking what you have to do the next day, <clears throat> until finally the election in November comes around, you win the presidency, then you get to be president, there's great celebration, all of your followers are popping champagne corks, celebrating for about two months, November, December, January, you're celebrating, very happy, making preparations to move into the White House. Then you get into the White House, you have that first night, the great inauguration, balls and dancing and celebration and all the movie actors, movie actresses, prominent sports stars, musicians, personalities all come to your balls. And Everybody is so happy, celebrating. But then the next day, you step into the White House, you know, eager, enthusiastic. But then there come the attacks, the criticisms, the obstinacy, the <clears throat> crises break out here, there. Oh, there's a problem with Iran, a problem with Israel, and Palestine, and problems with, could be Katrina or Gulf oil spills, or this policy, that problem. And you want to do it another day. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> one always is attached to one's name and history, so then four years of that, you think you would just want to resign and go, <laughs> go live in a monastery. But then you have to think, now the next presidential election is coming, I have to run for re-election. And one goes through this turmoil all again, till then if you win again, the, the re-election and you go through another four years of that, then after eight years you resign and it seems all like a bad dream has passed. So being like a Buddha, it's, you know, it's a little bit like being like the American president, except that it comes not so much through personal ambition, but through <laughs> great, great vows and great aspirations. But still you think, when I'm a Buddha, then I will be, you know, at the center of the spiritual universe. Everybody will be making offerings to me. I'll have so many hundreds of monastic disciples, maybe thousands of monastic disciples, hundreds and thousands of lay disciples. Devas will be coming to me. Brahmas will be coming to me. The kings of all of the states of India will be venerating me. Then when you get to be a Buddha, you think, wow, I just want a little peace and quiet. <laughs> yeah, so every once in a while, the Buddha thinks to himself, I'm tired of being surrounded by monks and nuns, lay followers, um, lay male followers, lay female followers, 
kings and princes and ordinary people and getting in these arguments with followers of the other sects, having to settle conflicts within the Sangha. Let me just go off and live in solitude. But there's a well-known sutta or an incident that's reported in the Vinaya where there was a big conflict taking place in the city of Kosambi, which divided the Sangha very bitterly. <laughs> and the Buddha tried to reconcile the two factions, but they just said to the Buddha, you stay out of it. <laughs> this is our business. We could settle this ourselves. And then the Buddha, he thought of the elephant, Sometimes the king of the elephant herd, chief elephant, is always surrounded by other male elephants which are struggling, competing with him, trying to drive him out of the position of being the king of the herd. Female elephants who are always trying to win his affection. Baby elephants that are always sort of misbehaving in his presence. And sometimes that bull elephant thinks let me just abandon the herd and go off by myself. And so the Buddha thought of the king elephant in this way, and then thought, let me also go off and stay by myself. And so the Buddha left the monastery, left the quarreling amongst to themselves, and went off to stay in a place called the Parileyaka forest. And while he was staying there, there was nobody to serve him, nobody to attend on him except an elephant came to serve him, and a monkey. <laughs> okay, so at this time too, the Buddha would have been a bit wary of living together with the whole Sangha, and so he just wanted to go off on his own. And if he were to report to the others, then they would say, oh, let us go with you. Oh, you can't go off by yourself. And then he wouldn't have had the solitude that he wanted. This reminds me of the time during my first years as a monk in Sri Lanka. I was living in this little temple, it's in the countryside, a little distance away from the village. And so I thought I wanted to go for a walk just to see what the village was like, to go past the village out into the countryside. <laughs> I don't quite know the conventions of with the way the lay people interact with the monks or what they expect from the monks. And so as I go walking through the countryside, I'm passing, you know, I get out of the village, coming into the countryside, and people see me walking, and then they say, Hanne, the venerable one, and the Teegak, you, the Bonda, Teegak, the Bonda, Bante, please come to our house and drink a little tea. <laughs> So you feel like you have to oblige them. <laughs> so you go to the house, they serve you some tea, then say, Andrade, uh, Enda, uh, Wadinda, Wadinda, Api, uh, Api, Pansala, Andrew, Pampa, Vendra, Pani. Pante, please come and meet the chief monk of our temple. And so to make them happy, you have to say, Andrade, Hari. <laughs> so you go to the temple and you go to the, come to the temple and the chief monk says, Teeka? Teeka Kona? Would you like to drink a little tea? And of course the people like to go and say, yes. <laughs> so you drink a little tea and chat a little chit chat with the chief monk until finally you take your leave and you depart. Walk a little further, somebody else comes out from the house and says, Hantaru. Koheda. Koheda Wadinne. Bhante, where are you going? Mama, uh, I have to take a walk. 
I've been in the Tikapa. I want to take a little walk. Oh, how to? I've been gave to the Wadinda Tikapa. Venerable, please come to our house and drink a little tea. <laughs> so <laughs> it becomes very difficult to get away. Okay, so here the Buddha, fortunately, he's not walking apparently through woodland, so he's not going to be held back by people inviting him to come to the house to drink some, tea, drink some tea. So finally, he comes to this park of the Gosinga solitary wood. And then there's a park keeper here. It seems to be like a, a preserve, a reserve. And they assigned this park keeper in order to protect the park so that people from the village don't come to cut down the trees and take the wood to their house to use for firewood. Okay, so when he comes, then the park keeper sees the Buddha coming and just he addresses him as recluse, ascetic. Do not enter the park. There are three young men here who are seeking their own good. In other words, these are like three ascetics living in the forest who are meditating to reach some kind of higher realization. And so he says, do not disturb them. Okay, but Anuruddha must have been tuned in to the do you call this the mind-controlled internet, mind-controlled television? And so he was able with his divine eye and divine ear to see what was taking place outside the forest, to hear this conversation. And so he would have come to the edge of the forest and he told the park keeper, please do not prevent the teacher from coming in. This is our teacher, the Buddha. Okay, and so then Anuruddha goes to the other monks, reports to them, and then they all come out to meet the Buddha and sort of welcome him and lead him into the forest. Okay, then they bring him to their dwelling place, they show him the usual courtesies that are due to a teacher, and they bow down to him, they wash, provide him with water, they wash his feet, and then they exchange the courtesies, courteous greetings. And then the Buddha says to them, I hope you're not meeting any trouble in getting alms food. That's the ordinary way in which wandering monks would greet one another. Anuruddha says, we're keeping well, we're not having any trouble getting alms food. Okay, then the Buddha brings up the important topic of this conversation. He says, I hope that you are all living in concord, in harmony, with mutual appreciation, without disputing, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes or with friendly eyes. And we often meet this description in the text where it's sometimes contrasted with another description. That is the description of monks who are arguing and fighting. I think we'll see this in Sutta number 128. Yeah, on page 1008, the very first paragraph, where it says, On that occasion, the monks at Kosambi had taken to quarreling and brawling and were deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers, like their tongues become knives or swords. And so when they speak to one another, they're insulting each other, abusing each other, reviling each other, speaking harshly to one another. But in contrast, we have the monks who are blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly, friendly eyes. OK, 
Okay, so Anuruddha replies that they're able to live together in this kind of harmony. And then the Buddha asks, how are you able to do so? Okay, then Anuruddha explains. He says, what I do, Bhante, is that I think it is a gain for me, a great gain for me, that I am living with such companions in the holy life, with such fellow monastics. Then he mentions three ways in which they live together in harmony. He says, I maintain bodily acts of loving kindness towards those venerable ones, both openly and privately. I maintain verbal acts of loving kindness towards them, both openly and privately, and I maintain mental acts of loving kindness towards them, both openly and privately. Okay, the key word here is the well-known word metta. Usually when we think of metta, or we hear about metta in Buddhism, we immediately think that it means doing a particular type of meditation. Like, what kind of meditation do you practice? What is your practice? Oh, my practice is loving-kindness meditation, metta bhavana. But the person might not pay much attention to how they act and interact with others. But the Buddha speaks about three ways of developing metta, three ways of practicing metta. The three ways of practicing metta are metta kaya kama, that's bodily action, which is. Can you read? Can you read? Oh, let me turn it to a different angle. So there's metta kaya kama. That means loving kindness through bodily action. And metta vachi kama, loving kindness expressed in speech. And metta mano kama, loving kindness in thoughts. And then each one is to be practiced in both ways. He says, towards them both openly and privately. So, for example, one can practice 
loving kindness by bodily action, openly, by, say, if one of the other monks gets sick, then his companion might bring him some hot water, bring him some medicines, might call a doctor to come to see him. Uh, if he's carrying some heavy load that he can't manage all by himself, he might help him to carry the load. So this is doing good, kind deeds towards him openly. And he could do also good deeds towards him secretly. For example, if maybe somebody could think of it, how would you practice loving kindness towards somebody privately or secretly so that they don't, it's not done openly? You do things like arranging their chair yeah. before they yeah. arrived, and you know, like arranging their things and yeah. supplying food and so on. And like putting sweet things in the fridge for them, things like yeah, that, yeah. giving them food. Yeah. <laughs> Infinite number of ways. Any other ideas? And the sick players. Excuse me? Sick players. This is bodily action. Oh, oh, that's Shuttle the walk for them, you know, if it's snowing or something. Like yeah, that. okay, that's a good idea. Okay. Like sometimes. Or carry somebody's, um, my next door neighbors and elderly ladies, so like I'll put in the car machine sometimes. Yeah, yeah, those are some good examples. And so in Buddhism, we attach like a special significance to doing good deeds for others almost secretly, without seeking any kind of recognition, acknowledgement for what we do. Okay, then there's maintaining loving acts of speech towards others, both openly and privately. Openly, of course, means you speak to them gently, in friendly ways, with soft voice, inquiring after their well-being. And how does one speak loving words to them privately or secretly? You can praise them to others. Right, okay, that's a good example. So you speak highly of them to others. Any other ways this might be done? Any ideas? Well, you could take the blame for something that they did. It's a bit extreme, but I actually saw that done once. I like, I made a mistake yeah. or dropped something in company with someone else, and later when they, they were explaining what had happened, they said, we yeah. dropped the thing. Mm -hmm. When it was just me, it had just been me that they said, we dropped the thing, and I thought, oh, and they said that. That's a very good and unusual example. Yeah. <laughs> Any other ideas? Can you do it negatively by refraining when you really want to go out with <laughs> That would be more a kind of restraint, okay. but this seems to be a positive action. Yeah. Anyway, I can't think of any myself. Well, you can advocate, I mean, speaking as a mother, sometimes you can explain yeah. what someone did, you know, the way, you know, make it more understandable or Oh, that's a less, good example. Yeah. Yeah. Advocate. Well, if somebody is, say, impinging on the rights or the well-being of one of your friends or contacts or even just an acquaintance, and you regard this as being unfair or unjust, then you can speak up in defense of that person. Mm -hmm. It's not the same as praising them, but you are right. advocating for their for their rights, for their welfare, or at least mitigating the harm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's an expression of loving kindness yeah. in speech. Did you have some idea? Um, I don't know if this is considered privately, but say if a, either a political leader or a leader of a movement um, give an idea to speech that will better the, the, the welfare of people in general. And people in 
in general don't really know that they're benefiting from this speech. Mm. Okay, this could be an example of a leader who speaks up on behalf of a great number of people. Not, I mean, not on behalf of them, but say they speak of issues about climate warming, yeah. global warming. Yeah. It's not on any specific person, but yeah. people will benefit from this philosophy greatly. Yeah, this is, I, I understand what you mean. Like say people who are distant from our place of residence, people in India, Africa, who would be greatly harmed by increased global warming. So if we advocate the policies that will control global warming on their behalf, we say that this is an act of loving kindness of or, speech. Or a teacher like you teaching the, the, the merit of loving kindness, and then mm -hmm. we in turn do things. Yeah. So you're not specifically saying something, people don't really know that we're actually, they're benefiting from your speech to us, teaching. Okay, maybe one example just occurred to me just now well, when you said that. Maybe it just exa exemplifies what you said, but it refers to a specific person. You know, it's a terrible thing that there's a woman in Iran, Iran, who's accused of adultery, and they want to bury, they bury her in sand with only the head emerging from the sand, and then they want to stone her to death. Now this organization Abbas has circulated a petition you know, spreading over the internet for people to sign protesting against that and then eventually they want to collect a hundred thousand signatures and then submit it to the authorities in Iran. I think I read that they're not going to stone her. But they still want to kill her. They still want to kill her. Yeah. yeah. They're yeah. Stone her. yeah. But there are 50, some 15 other people who are sort of on the lineup to be stoned to death. It has to be, I think that they haven't yet been convicted, but if they are convicted, then they will be subject to stoning to death. So the petition also covers them. Okay, so this is loving kindness, both openly and privately in speech. And then there's mental acts of loving kindness towards them, both openly and privately. Okay, <laughs> here the problem is just the opposite. Mental acts of loving kindness towards others openly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe there's, maybe there's a feel, maybe people can feel it if you just adopt a loving mind. You can change your intention, you know, in your work. Yeah. I, mean, I know in my work, as an editor, I try to shift towards doing good, yeah. selecting articles and that would help yeah. somehow. Yeah. So is, would that be a mental act to, to um, that one's intention turns towards meta? But is that openly? Because it manifests, the yeah. manifestation yeah, actually, it seems that there's sort of like complex inter intersections of bodily, verbal, and mental. So it begins with the mental, but then if you select an article, and you pass it off to a copy editor or something, <laughs> or to the people who work on the magazine, that might be called verbal. But probably, we would say it's, a, it's basically it's a mental act. Considered, even though one is not speaking, but it's a verbal act because it's a restraint of the speech. And what I would think is that the mental act openly means that you 
radiate or generate loving kindness towards them when you're in their presence. Whereas when you, you do it privately, when you know you might be in your room and then you just think of them with loving kindness, particularly if one generates the loving kindness towards them, there's a meditative practice. Okay, so these are three these three principles belong to a set of six principles that the Buddha teaches time and again in the suttas. They're called sometimes the six principles of cordiality and harmony and respect. I think you have them in Chinese. Is that what they're called? Okay. Excuse me? They're supposed to be Yeah. That's right, Yoga. Okay, so in the order in which they come in Pali, it's the loving kindness of bodily action, verbal action, mental action, then harmony through observing the same precepts, or observing precepts together, harmony through sharing one's gains. This is especially the case for monastics. Whenever one gets any kind of gains, even things on arms round, like the content of a bowl, the arms bowl, then one should share it with the other monks. And then there's the harmony in views, having a common understanding. In the case of Buddhism, based on you know, the Four Noble Truths, the three characteristics. Okay, but here only three of these are mentioned. Then Anuruddha goes on to explain more concretely how they're able to live in harmony. And this is expressed very beautifully. He says that, you know, when they're mixing together, he says, he, he thinks, why should I not set aside what I wish to do and do what these venerable ones wish to do? And he says, then I set aside what I want to do and I do what they want to do. In this way, even though we are different in body, but we become one in mind. Now, this isn't intended as a kind of metaphysical proposition that we all have <laughs> one mind and only the bodies are different, but it's more, you might call this a common sense proposition that we all agree to agree on what we're going to do. Instead of putting forward our own <coughs> purposes, our own intentions, I find out what the others want to do, and then we reach a kind of consensus. And so each one submits to the will of the others. And since they're all people of wisdom, loving kindness, who seek the good of the group, you don't have to be aware that one is going to be exploiting the others and trying to, using, to use the others to fulfill his own private ends. You know, the basic sort of underlying principle of American democracy, modern democracy, is that society consists of different factions, people with different interests. Each person is pursuing his own self-interest, and each group is pursuing its self-interest. Sort of the theory is that when everyone pursuing their own self-interest gets together it, to form a society, a state, Somehow there's like this magic, what they call it, the invisible hand. The hidden the invisible hand. This is behind the market or behind That's the, the state. Invisible yeah. hand of the marketplace. Yeah, the invisible hand of the market. But also it's supposed to be like the invisible hand in the democracy that ensures that each person pursuing their own self interest or the interests of their group, somehow all of these interests will balance each other out and so everybody will gain from it. But does it work in reality? <laughs> it depends on how much money one has <laughs> and the power of the particular organization to which one belongs, the power and wealth. But here, this shows, like, I think, the true way in which the interests of all are served is that is when each one seeks not his own self interest, but the interest of the group. And this way they can truly harmonize and truly promote the well-being and harmony of the group.
Okay, so then that's how Anuruddha explains their ability to live together in harmony. Okay, then the Buddha asks, I hope that you will all abide diligent, ardent, and resolute. I have to say, it seems to me that something is a bit misplaced in the way the sutta has been transmitted. Because this expression, dwelling diligent, ardent, and resolute, usually refers to the dedication to meditation practice. And yet the way Anuruddha is going to answer this in the first place, it doesn't relate to meditation practice, but it's more an expression of their group harmony in the way they conduct their everyday affairs. So this seems to illustrate better the way they live together through bodily acts, verbal acts, and even mental acts of loving kindness, rather than dwelling ardent, diligent, and resolute, which will come later. So, anyway, in reply to that question, Anuruddha replies that this is the way they live, diligent, ardent, and resolute. Then he explains their routine on the Andhra. He says, whichever of us returns first from the village with alms food, prepares the seats, sets out water for drinking and for washing, and puts the refuse bucket in its place. So apparently they go out separately on arms round, which might be the old style of which it was done. Nowadays, usually, when monks living in a monastery, even it could be a large monastery with a hundred monks, when they go out on arms round, they'll usually go in large groups in a single file line. But here, since they've got...